course, we've all we've all aged together, haven't we, Bob? Right. So I I knew about passion for angling only at the last minute because I took Chris Yates in my brand new company car, an Allegro. Remember them? Bloody horrible things, right? An Allegro. And, and it was uh, done so well. He never, he never said, Yates, he never said one word about this on the way. It was some distance. In that packed hall at Dunstable, Chris, uh, uh, on stage was Lynn Arbery. The first week of Red Mile was coming up for, for auction. I stood with Chris and he was right in the corner here. As you looked at the stage, he was on the right hand side. And at a thousand pound, he suddenly put his hand up. And I'm, what, 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 are you, what are you doing? You've got two aprons to rub together. What are you, what are you doing? He kept it in the air. And suddenly, the new bit of Chris Yates, and of course, a thousand people were bloody hell. Kept it in the air. 1100, 1200, <laughs> 1300, 2000 pounds sold to Chris Yates. What are you doing, Chris? I'll tell you on the way home. So that was my first thing. What was your first time of hearing about it? Uh, my first time of hearing about it was I knew Hugh Miles from when he was making a programme that was called Tom's River. And if you've never found a copy of Tom's River, I suggest you do. It's absolutely stunning. Um, and it was on the Longford Estate, which I lived on and partly worked on at that time. And Hugh was trying to create like a sort of glass boat, only he was putting it in the river and lying in it to try and film. Because bear in mind this is 30 odd years ago now, before we had anything like the sophisticated kit you've got now. And I asked him, why are you trying to do that, Hugh? And why don't you just cut a bit of the bank out and put a window in the bank? And you could see the little thing came on. Ah, so that's what we did. Um, we literally got a carrier off the side of the river, shut it, drained it, got a digger, cut an area out, put a shop window in and a roof on and a little step so we could go down inside it. And then we could flood the carrier, however deep or slow we wanted it. He had me planted the different weeds in for the different species of fish. And Mark, the riverkeeper, had said to, to Hugh, if you need some fish, you'll need to know where they are. You need to ask Bob James. He always seems to know where they are. So that was how my association with Hugh had begun. Um, at, at that time, he was probably you known as the best wildlife filmmaker in this country probably ever had. Kingdom of the Ice Bear, Condom of the Ice Bear. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the friendship developed. I, I also realised he was a very, very good fisherman, not just a fantastic wildlife maker. So. He said he always wanted to make a fishing film because he felt no one had really touched the sort of true spirit of it. There was too many ego trips involved, too many trade names involved, or whatever else. So it started to sort of churn over with the two of us. And then at Christmas, his wife Sue used to ring me and say, what can I get you for a Christmas present, a little fishing thing? And I said, ah, there's two things this year. I said, there's a reel I know he particularly wants. And a friend of mine has just written a book, Casting at the Sun. Still one of the greatest angling books ever written by probably one of the greatest angling writers this country's ever produced, in my opinion. So she bought Hugh the book and the reel. I rang on Boxing Day as I normally did. How are you doing, Sue? She said, oh, you and that bloody book. I said, what, didn't he like it? She said, like it. He has to come out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so Hugh came on the phone. He said, do you know this guy? And I said, yeah, we've known each other since we're teenagers. So uh, he said... How well do you know? I said, well, you know, pretty well. We fish together. So said, that's the other guy I want for the film. But originally, he actually kind of saw Hugh, uh, Chris more narrating it while I fished. But for those of you who actually know Chris, which is probably not many of you, he's tremendously competitive. It, it, but he, he never shows it. He's actually a very thinking guy. You know, all this sort of bumbly business about, you know, not doing this and doing that. Chris knows exactly what he's doing in exactly the same way as Rob did with all that bumbling. Um, so we entered into to doing things. We went fishing a few times together. We, we all got on great together. And Hugh then said, OK, this is what I want to do. Uh, I'm, I, in fact, some of this stuff I'm, I must let Chris have because it, it should be uh, sort of hidden away forever rather than hidden away in my drawer, probably get thrown away when I peg out. But the original concept was six half hours. Um, but then we started fishing together, we started writing things together, and, and Hugh said, I don't think we can do this in half hours. 
But to do six one hours of television at that time was a mammoth task. I mean, that's like four Hollywood films in length. And it was on film, not digital. So, you know, 20 minutes and you've got to change the role of film. So, so that was really where it kind of all kicked off from. Uh, and, and Hugh was going to budge his hit. Obviously, Chris wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it used to be you know, up to me to drive Chris everywhere and then claim the petrol back and the food back from Hugh uh, and so on and so forth. That, that's how my introduction. Can I, can so, I ask, can I ask a question? Yeah. How, how high would you have, would he have gone? <laughs> <laughs> how, how big was the budget? Uh, we, we didn't actually have a, a limited budget. Um, I, I think we thought we were going to get it for about a thousand pounds because that's about what it normally went for. Um, but I think Richie McDonald and one or two others tweaked something was going on, so they just kept pushing the bidding up. Because what it would have been great fun at nineteen hundred pounds was to stop and let Richie buy. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, no, we, we didn't honestly sort of have a limit on the budget to make that series in the end and bear in mind that's 30 years ago was well over a quarter of a million quid so 2,000 quid from Red Mile wasn't actually that bad yeah, yeah, he, he told me on the way home and of course at that stage all that Chris told me is they were contemplating the film uh, for Red Mile only what one episode of Red Mile. So obviously it developed past that. This is, but but suddenly the season's upon you. What happened? I mean, it was only a few weeks later, wasn't it, Bob? Yeah. Um, well, obviously it, you know, it was a huge thing. It was a huge thing to undertake. It was a it was a great thing for me to do because I'd never actually been to Red Mile with Chris. So you couldn't dream of a better place to go and fish Red Mile with, really, could you? you know? I mean, Chris just lived Red Mile. Became part of it. So I was just walking around with him and, and, and just his recollections of all the various spots. And because he's a great naturalist, I don't mean he walks around with no clothes on. I mean, he's, you know, he's been to the wildlife. <laughs> so that, that part of it was a huge pleasure. Um, but equally, it, it was, the fishing got quite competitive between the two of us. And he actually told me nothing about how to catch a fish. <laughs> well, I was left entirely to my own devices as to how I caught um, Mark Carp from Redmire. Um, one, of course, is, is quite famous because everyone says you fell out of a tree. No, I didn't. I jumped out of a tree. And believe it or not, even that far back, we got a load of criticism for that. Oh, children will copy you. You know, but you're, you're risking lives doing that live on television. Oh, for goodness sake. But look how it is now. Look how bad it is now. So, goodness, you know. See any biggins that week? <laughs> That's it. always the question, isn't it? Um, no. <laughs> I, I'm not, it's a funny old lot, isn't it? All this business about Red Run, all these monsters and what was there and what's not. Um, I don't think I'm too bad at finding fish. I've been doing it for a few years. And I spent a lot of time. We went, obviously went up there before the start of the week. It was the beginning of the season and, and we were kind of allowed to go up there for three days before. Um, and you think it's all going to be you know, dead easy, but then up run by the shallows by the islands, up on the West Bank, Hugh then wanted to put a scaffold tower up to film us from. So we all, we just thought, oh, shit, that's it, isn't it? We, there's going to be nothing in the shallows for the rest of the year, is there, after you've got this scaffold tower up. But amazingly, they get used to it after a few hours, let alone a few days. It's really quite surprising. Um, so... We went, suddenly we had an advantage no one had had a red mile before because we could suddenly sit the 35 inch tower and see the whole lake. Um, no, when you say never saw any big one, I think, I, I think we, we saw a few fish that, that I would have bought at 30s, but certainly certainly nothing more than that. No, you know, seeing big fish that kind of came later in the last program in the series, but not, not the first one. Um, and ironically, every fish we caught was 24 pounds, which is bizarre, isn't it? Every single fish we caught was 24 pounds. Um. Um, a big thrill for Chris, and uh, I noticed it at the time, was of course his very first red mile carp, the one with no pelvic vents. Uh, he caught on the film. No, I uh, oh, sorry, you caught it. it. Was yeah, my yeah, first yeah, yeah, it was your first. Sorry, it's, that's it. It was Bob's first carp, and it, but, yeah, and it was the same fish from all the, from you know 20 years all before. Those, yeah, yeah. It, it was the, it was the same one, but. Uh, but so, you know, creeping around the place, I mean, I, I know Hugh 
quite well myself. A massive taskmaster. Uh, I fished with him in France when I'll knock on the door at five. And without fail, every day he knocked on the door at five. I mean, I know, I mean, it's an open secret anyway. I mean, you were living with one another in the end for four years, Bob, the filming. Yeah, nearly four years. He was a hard taskmaster. <laughs> In, in some ways, it's, it's a huge education working with somebody like that because you realise an incredible amount of dedication and, and, uh, that they will put into something like that. And because when you're making a film, you always want to be doing it at dawn because, as he said, if you start filming something at dawn, you know you can carry on because the light's going, OK, the light's not going to be so nice, but it's going to continue. Whereas because you start filming something in the evening and you've got a sudden shut-off, which makes it very difficult for him. And, and of course, what you also have to realise is it's not a documentary, all right? <laughs> it was made for entertainment. It was made to try and promote the sport. The sport of angling was getting some serious stick at the time. Uh, and we genuinely set out to try and show people the nice side of our sport, not exercise egos. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, hopefully, that's successfully what we did. You, you weren't going to get audiences of 13 million just with anglers, were you? So uh, that's the size of audience we got. But to, yeah, to go back to the point with Hugh, you can imagine, you know, Chris is not exactly great at early mornings. Uh, and actually, I'm not that great at early mornings either. But so Hugh would have you up at dawn every morning. Um, and then sometimes, <laughs> the more pressure it seems to put on me, actually, the more I seem to like it, the more I concentrated. Whereas the more pressure it put on Chris, the more he went to pieces. He didn't like it. If there was a tree anywhere near him, he would cast into it. Uh, you know, that's the nature of the beast. And when you've only got 20 minutes on a roll of film, you only get to cast in the street once and that roll of film's in the bin. So you can imagine the, the tension it started to create. And Hugh, to be fair, said to him, look, you guys have been friends for a long time. I know, I've watched you too. There's, you, you've got a chemistry. That, you know, you, you complement each other. It's brilliant. But before this is over, you're going to want to punch each other's lights out. Uh, so you sat down at some stage, the three of you, and contemplated more programmes. How did you come to the decision to do uh, Midwinter Madness, uh, so on and so forth? Ed? I think a lot of it, obviously, you know, Midwinter Madness was, it was I think, it's one of the nicest ones of all. And, and Hugh would be working a lot in the summer, so much of Hugh's fishing at that time was roach fishing in the winter, which is something I was particularly into as well at the time. So that was kind of a natural one. And the idea of spreading it over the seasons, I mean, that's, it's just kind of obvious, isn't it? You've got to have some sort of pecking order to do it in. So we, we'd already started, we, we were going to make the first one, as you quite rightly say, the Red Bar one, and we finished making it, and at the end of it, he said, well, that's it. And that, that was absolutely fantastic, far more than I could have ever expected. Come on, let's do the whole lot. But we had sort of penned out what we would do if we continued. We, we didn't wing it quite that much. Um, uh, uh, to say, uh, 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 what, about, what about venues? Did you have problems uh, going to... Well, no, I mean... Yeah, yeah, obviously I know some of the answers to the questions. But, yeah, I mean, the, was it a problem in, in getting some of the filming done? Uh, generally speaking, no, because most of it was done on private places, which, which you, you more or less had to do, you know, for, for the fact that we needed the same spot day after day after day after day. Um, and it was funny, because at that time I, I was writing a lot. Improve Your Course Fishing had started. I, I wrote in that every month for about 17 years. And, and at the same point, Improve Your Course Fishing said, oh, we want you to start doing features on day ticket waters. And I said, well, I don't fish day ticket waters, you know, it's as simple as that. Oh, well, it's not actually of much use to our readership then, is it? And I said, well, why? Um, you know, to me, when I used to read the Anglia magazines and read about Redmar, you know, that was like your dream. That was what you, you aspired to. You know, not go and fish Clapham Common that anyone could go and fish. So I said, didn't you have golf magazines and, you, you know, you'll fish, you, you'll, 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 you'll film, you'll rather on the, on the magazines, you report on all the great golf tournaments in your athletics magazine, you have the Olympics, but not everyone can go to the Olympics. So why have we suddenly got this weird thing in fishing? Unfortunately, you know, Hugh was exactly the same. But he said, no. You know, you, you sort out the venues, and at the time, well, you, you probably saw the thing, I had two flat coaches and retrievers, and a, and a Jack Russell board across, which would kill everything the retrievers had retrieved. Um, <laughs> um, so I had a lot of content. Raps, Chester, and Thistle. 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 
Um, so I had a lot of contacts with a lot of estates, to be honest. You know, for part of my life, I dreamt to be a river keeper. I'd already moved out to Salisbury by then from, from London. I was I met a lot of river keepers. I was working with the one who just done his 21 years in the Royal Marines and was the Royal Marines boxing champion. And I'd finally found out why so many river keepers were ex-servicemen. It's not because they know anything about rivers. It's because they're ever so good at dealing with gypsies. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, all right. Uh, obviously, we're carp based here today. We can talk about the amazing roach catch, the, the big pike, and stuff like that. How did you find the lake where Harry's monster lived? No, it was me. There was a chap called Ron Thorpe who was the keeper on there, who, who I knew very well. To very quickly give you a funny little story, um, one of my fishing guys was a guy called Greg Lake, as in Emerson Lake and Palmer. Um, he bought a beautiful estate on the River Allen, just near Wimbledon St Giles, which is where the lake is, I'm sure you all know by now. Um, and his keeper, a guy called Robert, he used to take me on to Wimbledon St Giles estate, working the dogs and so on, and fishing the river. Um, and then Ron said, he said, oh, we've got a lake on there, you know, with some quite big fish, and I bet you'd like that. So I went over and had a look at it and fell in love. Um, and then Chris, at, at that point, because Chris and I used to go and see Donald Gleaney at that point, and, and Mrs. 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 Packham used to Mrs. make us a, make a fruit cake, and, and you had pots of tea. It was lovely. It was a very old English sort of thing. And I, I, it was, Chris introduced me to a lot of very lovely things in life like that. He has a bit of a knack of getting to know these rather lovely eccentric characters. So, Lady had retired and he'd given Chris, well, actually, weren't his stocking records, what did you know, because you know, we moved up with you. They were actually, they were up here. Everything was done on, on carbon copies in those days, and they were all the back copies of all his invoices, and we spent weeks reading through them. Well, there were so many, and of course, Chris found Wimbledon and Giles in there. So we then realised that it had actually been stocked to the very same year as Redmire. So that was what we were looking at with a load of fish of exactly the same strain. So how exciting was that? Uh, what happened the first time you went? Uh, did you go for a recce, team member? Yeah, what yeah, happened? we went. We went for several reckeys. There were. It was. It was very shallow. A lot of it was covered in mare's tail, um, and it was heaving with dace because the Little River Allen runs through it. So it's a bit of an unusual mixture, um, dace and carp. But there were very few carp in it, even at, at that point. Um, and I think we probably more or less filled all of them except Harry. I mean, if, if it's the sort of Harry story you want, in a way. I mean, um, we, Chris and I had seen Harry a couple of times but quite a way off. And bear in mind at that point, the only person that I personally knew in the country, I don't know if anyone else knew any, who'd caught a 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 was Chris. So if there's anyone you were going to go, if he says it's 60 pounds, it's 60 pounds, it's Chris. <laughs> in a water bath. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we'd actually made the program and we'd taken Mickey Rouse, the Anglin Times photographer, yes, a great character, I don't know if he's still about, and a guy called John McKenzie. We'd met them in, in Cranbourne and we put them in the back of Yates's van with carp sacks over their heads, used ones. Um, <laughs> so they wouldn't know where it was and drove them off onto the estate and got them out of the van, took the sacks of their heads. Um, up and off we walked down to the lake. Well, this is November time. This that very shallow lake, and it had been frosty, hard frost. So Hugh had got his camera and his tripod, and next, and I've got a rod and reel each. We were just going to pose up some shots for Angling Times to say that the series is coming out. Mickey Rouse, who's also a keen angler, said, "Should we approach the water a bit quieter?" And we said, well, "Don't forget it. You know, it's hard enough to try and find him in the winter, in, in the summer, Mickey. You're not going to find him now." Oh. Well, will you go ahead and have a look if you want? So Mickey drops off down the track and got to me. And we all came down. So we walked up, we slowed down and we walked up, and there was a weed bed left about half the size of this tent. And sticking out the side of the weed bed, you know, there was a dorsal, and, and then a space, and then a tail. And, and I'm not exaggerating, that was that much, and that was half the carp sticking out the back. So the eight said, I'm just going to, that's it, that is the fish. So Hugh has now got his, his camera set up in the thing. I've actually got some bait in my pocket, as I usually have. So I've actually just side hooked the boiling. and I've got it over this weed bed and it's hanging over the weed bed, just free line. I've no other tackle there. And the carp's backed out and then started to come up towards it. Hugh's now thumping his camera going, 
Bob's going to catch the record carpet. I've got no fucking film in my camera. We were only supposed to do that. Excuse my French. <laughs> so, and it was getting quite tense because it, it backed off again. It went round at another angle, you know, they tend to. And we were right up to it again. We couldn't even see how close it was because it was on the other side of the weed bit. But you could see that's what he was doing. And then, it's amazing, isn't it? In that depth of water, suddenly a 60 pound carp can just dematerialise, just fade away. And that's what he did. And it faded away and we never saw it again. But unquestionably, it was, was there. Uh, and, and Chris, at that point, was now stood on, on Hugh's camper van um, to, to get a better view of it. And, and, and he still says it was £60. Uh, if you remember that particular episode, um, tell us the name of the pub where you met Harry Teasdale, who was the keeper. And uh, hence the name Harry's Monster, where it came from. And what did he, it was a lovely turn of phrase he had, it was chasing, always oh, big at my lap door, chasing, chasing for me. <laughs> yeah. He was a lovely character, he, was, he, he came from the North East, had that, that great accent, it was such a lovely straightforward character. Um, it's a very complicated question what you just asked me, probably the most complicated question I'm going to get here. Um, in the film, we walk across a bridge over the river and go into a pub. Yes. That is the Mayfly on the River Test, yeah. just above Stockbridge. We then go in the door, and that's the Green Dragon in Alderbury. At that time, you know, it was, we had to be so careful to try and throw everybody off the set. I mean, now, you know, you pitch up there, I don't really think it's a problem. But at, at that time, just off the back of filming, it would have just been hell. So an, an awful lot of shots as well are flipped. So, you know, even if you think you recognise the place, you don't suddenly when it's the opposite way around. So, you know, suddenly the River Test was flowing in the opposite direction when we yeah, went yeah, in the yeah, pub. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the actual pub we walked into, yeah, is the Green Man in Order, which is just off the side of Longford Estate, which was obviously also where a lot of, a lot of the filming was done. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's where Chris produces the, the, the back copies and, and Harry sees them and, and he, then he drove us over to Wimbledon and Giles uh, we stood in his Land Rover, on his Land Rover, I seem to remember, uh, and he was, he, he recalled the yarn on, on film. Uh, and as you say, you know, when he was trying to describe it, he said, well, I don't know how to describe it. He said, it's about as long as my Labrador, because he had his Labrador there, and it was a fat Labrador, and he said it was as wide across the back as my Labrador. Because Chris and I now, we've just gone on. <laughs> uh, I was found between the pair of you, I mean, uh, Chris always the slight dreamer, you much more down to earth. You mentioned sixty pounds. Do you really believe that? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think you, you, you sort of like to believe it. I, I think probably at the time I, I, I probably did. Um, you know, there, were, there were other fish in there which we filmed, uh, yeah, and you yeah. saw quite clearly because there was a common that you quite clearly saw that white mark on its head, which you yeah, called yeah. Arnie. Arnie yeah. Well, I, I went back after the program and caught Arnie, and it, which actually should have been Arness, because it was a female, and it had just spawned, and it was 39.12, I think, or 39.14, so it was just under 40, so we'd actually got the estimation of that pretty close. Um, Chris caught one, I think that was about 24, 26, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you, you know, and, and then there you make another good point, really. We didn't film continually for three years. You know, Hugh had all sorts of other projects going on all around the world. Uh, and, uh, and what made that even harder was you'd start filming the sequence and then if you had to go away, what well, you had to do to re re restart the same sequence the following year to, to have the same weather conditions. So you'd have to remember what you were wearing. <laughs> and if, if you sort of made a cock up, you always had to have a stone on the floor. So if you sort of walked over there and did a cast and you would go, no, that's no good, do it again. You had to know where your spot was and walk back to so you could start exactly the same spot again and on one occasion <laughs> Chris did 11 restarts <laughs> to try and film the sequence and, and it, oh, it's not telling tales out of, out of school really um, and, and it did it caused tension between all of us uh, and towards the end Chris and Hugh were just like having nothing to do with each other I, I literally had to like, get Chris there every morning and, and then ironically you know after we finished it all and then Chris went off and did his thing, and I went off and did mine, and everyone thinks we had a fight, which we never actually did. You know, we'd never, ever not actually spoken to each other. Um, I think I then got accused of having kind of knowledge of his wife, which is also not true. <laughs> but that's the sort of nasty part of, 
of the fishing world is, isn't it? So I, I hope you didn't spoil it for everybody else too much. I, mean, I found it a bit hard. Chris and I, we spent a lot of time together in that part of our life, which, which, which probably, again, really, you know, just being completely straight about the whole thing, having some, spent a lot of time together, both fishing and, and sort of family-wise, because Chris was starting the family then. Uh, and we, we were both very keen on our old fishing books, uh, or we still are. Uh, in fact, that'll give me another one to, to tell you in a minute. Uh, and we used to quote passages from each other's fishing books to each other a lot. Right. It was just part of our I farm. Love that. I love that, yeah. Yeah, well, that's nice, and it was genuine. It was totally genuine. Yeah. We were always telling each other about you know books we hadn't heard of, and then equally, do you know why it was called a passion for angling? Yeah. Because one of the, our favourite fishing books was a book by a chap called Morris Weekin called The Passionate Angler, and, and we kicked it around for ages because we couldn't say the passionate anglers because that <laughs> we got accused of being shirtlifted by some of the northerners as it was <laughs> so so we had to twist it in fact ironically it was dave ball i don't know if you been a good friend of mine at the time who actually sort of worked out to twist it around but still got that same meaning so it so that that was why it was called passion angling it was basically named after one of our favorite fishing books so and, and so were, were quite a lot of those quotes it was just the three of you. Did you have a gopher ever? No, do you? No? No. No, no. no we had to lug all our own stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you had to get everything there, make sure it was the same stuff. You know, I mean, I arrived at Red Mart with Yates' bike in my car. And, um, I mean, actually, it, it, it's the little bits that you like. I, I think really little bits that you know, don't normally come out. Kelly Kettle. Do you know who's Kelly Kettle it was? It was Dave Swallow who was Kelly Kettle. Dave Swallow had a tackle shop in Down Valley, very good um, roach fisherman. And when he knew that's what we were going to do, he, he said, look, this might be nice, why didn't you use this? And I just looked at it and said, piece of crap, you know, I've got a kettle. <laughs> so I gave it to Chris. How many Kelly kettles have they sold off the back of that? <laughs> oh, it's, it's horrid. I'd much rather we celebrate it with some claret. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there were lots of quirky little bits like that. Uh, and funny enough, I mean, you know, I used to use almost as much old tackle at that time as Chris did. You know, and I still love it. I've still got, I've still got the first the camera I ever had. I still take your marble fishing. Um, and, and Chris and I are just Chris and Jack Hargraves never met. I take it most probably know Jack Hargraves was used to make fishing programs, beautiful fishing programs that we all loved as kids. And I knew Jack through my connection with Greg Lake. And, and he wanted to meet them. And unfortunately, Jack died a week before I scheduled for them to meet. Um, and I, so I had a, it's a lovely rod that Jack had given me and I had a, a, a beautiful four and a half inch aerial that Fred Buller had sold me, I can't say he gave it to me, <laughs> he sold it to me. And, and so we, Chris and I had been making this little bit of film of kids uh, for Southern Television and it started raining. So Chris being the lovely chap that he, he was, he, he got my barbecue and spread it out on the floor of his van for the kids to sit on with my, match, with my aerial in the pocket. So that was never ever any good ever again. <laughs> so, so you know that kind of didn't get used, and, and it was Hugh who, who, who actually said, "No, this is much more fun that you two are like a bit juxtaposition." So actually, it was a little bit overplayed. Uh, you know, otherwise, some of those situations I would have been there with my my own roach perfection or, or whatever. But it was good fun to, to sort of play it off like that, and, and I think in a way some of the the sort of stuff that went around afterwards about all oh, you know Bob and Chris are worlds apart came from that and then because people have to jump in one school or the other didn't they so um, but no we never lost respect for each other right, where did the connection of Bernard Cribbins come from and ultimately Chris Sanford who, who I might have put in the frame probably uh, but was it right okay uh, how, so had you professionally met yeah he already knew Bernard Cribbins. Bernard had narrated some things that he'd done years before. He very famously made a film about robins. Uh, and Bernard had done the, the voices for the... I fish with Chris Sanford now, and I've done for a, a little while, so he's wanted me fishing, mate. I, yeah, sort of fish with him, but uh, we're talking all, all, all the time. Um, and yes, he did have a, yeah, he did have a, a, a number one record, and he was a winged cleaner, and he did uh, another great claim to fame. He was with Tommy Steele, half a sixpence. So you'll see a very young Chris Sanford dancing around in the troupe. With, with but very first time when he moved to where he is now, and I uh, uh, didn't I went for, for dinner, 
and uh, it's the first time we've been to this house and I'd never seen this picture before but in the hallway um, there was a black and white picture right in front of you as you opened the door and it was taken at the ABC studios in Birmingham and Chris's number one hit record was exactly the time when the Beatles were also, you know. And uh, there's a picture of Chris, you know, at, at the rehearsal for the, sh for the show, Top of the Bobs, right? And uh, there's Chris, and it, underneath it says, me and the chaps. <laughs> yeah, he's actually on stage with the Beatles, can you believe it? <laughs> um, where do we get to? Um, so, so again, Chris Sam was a fisherman, so it was, it was rather nice that, that he did all the quotes um, throughout the series, which, which kind of reflects back to exactly what you said, Tim. We, we loved all, all those quotes, and, and so they were sort of heartfelt from us, and, and I think enhanced the whole thing. And I, I think, again, you know, we talked us about how many Kelly Castles did you sell, you know, how many people got into sort of collecting the books and stuff off the back of it, which is great, you know, it's a great, it's a great credit to us, and we, we, we love it. We're so pleased that it had that effect. Uh, another thing, because we're going deep into it now, who chose the music? How did the music happen? The, the music was beautiful. Um, we hummed and hard around with music. Uh, you know, uh, well, certainly Chris's then wife Claire played the flute extremely well. We we visited, we gone down the avenue of Claire doing some of the stuff on the flute. Um, Hugh's father was a conductor um, and a, a great instrumentalist. Um, my music wasn't quite so sophisticated, <laughs> but I had some. Um, and then Hugh had this woman, Jenny Musket, who'd written some music for something else he did. Uh, and he suggested that he get her to write some stuff. So she wrote a little bit. And we went into the studios up in Soho. Of all places, we sat in a basement in Soho doing bits of voiceover. Because it doesn't matter how careful you are, at some point when you're filming an aeroplane or something goes over and screws the sequence. So you've either got to film it all again, or you just voice that a bit over. There's nothing cheating about it, it's just what you've got to do when you film it. Um, and there was a guy called Trevor Barber who was extremely good at doing all these... At some points in that program, there's eight soundtracks running. There'd be me, there'd be Chris, there'd be the, the wildlife, there'd, there'd be the water. It's incredible how much mixing goes together to give you that depth of sound and make you feel you're in the countryside. And it, it was Trevor, Barber, actually, who was listening to the bits that we were throwing around musically, and he said, oh, without any question, it's that. And it was the music, Jenny Musket, so then she wrote the rest of the music for the series. Um, and it, 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 I have to say, even for me, as soon as you hear those sort of first two chords, you, you've got to you know exactly what it is and what it's going to be. <coughs> Regent Sound. Regent Sound. Regent Sound. Regent Sound. I can't even remember. I just, I just remember it. It just seems so. Mm, it, it just seems so bizarre to be so walking up through all these strip clubs to go down a, in a basement to, to be doing voiceovers for a fishing program. <laughs> uh, right now, come on. So we've done all the factual bits. Let's talk about the outtakes. Let's talk about the balls up. <laughs> well, in all honesty, there aren't that many. Most of them are in it. <laughs> we, we didn't have that many. We didn't have that many things to chuck out, to be honest. I gave you one of a sort of few home truths. Um, I jumped out of the tree. Uh, Yancey kind of attempted to let himself out of the tree and got came out far worse than I did. Uh, and Hugh absolutely loved it. He didn't know we were going to do it. Um, no. Uh, and, and, it, and he laughed. And of course, if your cameraman laughs and he's got the camera on his shoulder, it does this. So we actually had to jump out of the tree again the next day. To reenact the bit. But he laughed. So we, we spent the whole evening enjoying all our clothes out. We were so lucky. We had the most stunning weeks where we were at Redmark. So every time we got safely wet, you could dry all your clothes out and put them on again the next morning. Except for him. Because he ended up way over the top of his way just laughing. <laughs> when we made that sequence. And he had this thing called a Serengeti shower. <laughs> a big polythene hot water bottle, which is matte black one side. Uh, and clear the other side, and you put it in a tree facing the sun, and it absorbs the heat of the sun, the water all day, 
then you can have a little shower under it at night. So, because Chris and I, we were going underneath the outlet by the pump station, that was just getting in there and having a splash. So he was all posh and he's having his shower and he's all covered in soap. And, we, <laughs> and, and Chris said, we're telling there's some people coming. So we were, hurry up, you, there's some women coming down the track. No, he said, we well, said, yeah, no, seriously, listen. And at that point, we go like this, you know, making footsteps. So he's pulled this thing out of the tree and it's now going wrapped around his head, <laughs> covered in soap, and three women came down the track, <laughs> which we didn't even know were there. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so that, that was quite funny. That's, that's kind of an outtake. Well, what else was outtake? I'm trying to think. Goodness me. I, I honestly don't think there were that many, because if there were, I'm, I'm sure you know, something would have happened. And the whole point of the outtake stayed in, so they weren't outtake, they were intakes. Uh, right, I must uh, ask you about Kevin. Right, uh, For those who you'll remember, uh, the Scarecrow in the shallows. Uh, how was that filmed, by the way? Did Was it filmed from scaffolding, or was it a mixture from the punt and scaffolding, or was it, right? Just explain to, to ha how the sequence happened. Um, it, it was, I think it was one of Chris's you know, normal little geniuses that, that, as I think I said to start with, you think everything he does is completely cranky. It's not. He thinks he's through pretty well. <laughs> Um, so he came up with this idea, he was going to put a scarecrow in the shallows and he was going to feed in front of it for the whole week we were there. So the fish would just get completely used to taking this bait in front of this person in the coat and the hat and the fishing rod. And it worked. Um, so then Chris, one morning, swapped them over. He went out, took the scarecrow out and stood there himself. But of course, lost the fish. <laughs> so again, it wasn't. It, it was an outtake we stayed in because we could have left him out there to catch one. But it's much more fun to just leave you where it was, you know, after you put all that much effort in. Um, there's, there's quite a few pictures around of, of, of Hugh in the boat filming him, because I'm going to say, I remember I took, took quite a lot. Someone needs to get onto John Ward Allen. John Ward Allen's got an OXO tin full of pictures that I took while we were filming at Redmond. Yeah. Um, and I know um, Tony Mears, he, he was trying to get it off him because he's doing a red marble for the moment. Yeah. Um, and, and, he, and John Ward has not come across to it. It's a bit naughty. No, I can't so, try uh, with John from Yates, but the Hutchie book, um, and he's denying all knowledge of him. It, well, it's uh, not an Oxo tin. I remember because you know, well, it's why I used to love stuff like that. And, uh, very few of them have ever seen the light of day. OK, that's a bit of a sad note. Um, we'll end with a high note. The one you like, you enjoyed catching the most. <laughs> uh, this is going to be an honest answer. Yep. The one that's not in the film. Which one? <laughs> um, at the time, Rich Gardner had brought out a funny little nodding donkey thing. It was a little plastic tube with a little poly, a little pe little poly ball, a little brass light, and I thought that is just going to be the nuts up red light. Um, because of how suspicious they were. Um, and, and I caught one on, on, on one of those. I was absolutely, just couldn't believe it. Um, 20. Yeah, 24. It's another 24. Oh, 24. All 24. We have five fish there. All weigh 24 pounds. Um, and, and Hugh, and, and, well, mainly Hugh, he said, do you mind if we leave that one out of the programme? I'm like, what? You know, that's the, the most fun one to me of all, because you can see this thing sitting there, and it just suddenly goes, boop. Place ruts and so on. So it was so different from anything else. I think certainly that I never, any other way I'd ever fished before. Um, and they said, no, it'd be much nicer if you've caught two each. So, so there you go. There's, 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 there's the third carp. For so, so no, I'm never afraid of all that kerfuffle. I mean, I've, been, I've, I've been involved in quite a few fishing lakes and stuff over the years now. And generally speaking, if you've got a tree you want out of the way, drop it in the lake, give it about 20 minutes, and then go fish next to it because that's where the carp will be. You know, everyone else will go down the other end thinking it's scared them all away. No. No, all the banging bivy pigs in, they don't seem very keen on that. But just about anything else, any commotion, anything that's going on, and the fish will turn up. Put your hands together. Marvellous. Absolutely marvellous. Well done, Bob. Well done, indeed. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, entertaining. You got warts and all, which was nice, wasn't it? So <laughs> we got any more questions, just to finish off? I think we're all, almost done now. So obviously, come up and have a word with uh, Bob. He'll still be here for a little while. Thank you very much. Can we do, can we do the raffle? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we do the raffle. You're done, mate. Thank you. There you go.